Since it's one of the most common types of approaches, the ILS has some specifications that are standard no matter what runway or airport you're using. There are also some aspects of the ILS approach that are different depending on where you're arriving. Let's look at what's the same on all approaches and what varies from procedure to procedure. This is a typical ILS, the approach to runway 31 at Sioux City. Chapter 1 of the AIM lists some of the standard specifications of the ILS approach. First of all, the coverage of the ILS is very limited. Unlike a VOR approach, which is transmitted omnidirectionally all the way around, the ILS signal is focused along the extended runway centerline. Within 10 miles of the localizer antenna, the signal is only receivable in an arc offset 35 degrees to either side of the centerline. While further out, to 18 miles, it's even more directional, only receivable 10 degrees to either side. This means that an aircraft being vectored from the opposite end of the approach would start off outside the operational service area even as it flies very close to the airport and would only receive the signal and have the glide slope and localizer needles come alive once inside the area. We learn that the localizer signal is what allows us to stay on course laterally as we approach on an ILS, but there are some specifications of the ILS which vary due to the nature of the system. The antenna is located at the opposite or departure end of the runway we're approaching. The signal spreads out from the antenna, getting less sensitive as it radiates further away. Each localizer is configured so that the width of its signal is the same at the threshold of the runway. It's 700 feet wide, meaning there is 350 feet from the center line to the extreme end on either side. This is standard for all approaches, but think about what this means for the signal itself. Not all runways are the same length. Since the localizer signal starts at the back of the runway, the sensitivity will need to be adjusted for different runways. A shorter runway will have its signal start closer to the approach threshold so it'll need to widen out sooner from the origin in order to meet that 700-foot requirement. Since the 700-foot requirement is standard, two different length runways will have different looking localizer feathers. What this means is that the localizer on the longer runway will be more sensitive a given distance away from the antenna. Let's say we're 7 miles away from the localizer antenna, or just the same 7 miles away from the runway threshold. Either way, a deflection of our aircraft to the right or left by a certain distance will cause us to be completely off the feather for the longer runway, while causing just a partial deflection for the wider signal of the shorter one. So for a given distance on the approach, we can't say for certain how far a full deflection will be. The FAA makes note of this on the knowledge exams and tests your knowledge of ILS specifications accordingly. So on an ILS approach, the localizer is at the back of the runway and transmits its signal along the extended center line. The glide slope transmits from the side near the approach end of the runway to provide vertical guidance. ILS approaches will often incorporate a middle marker and an outer marker. The middle marker identifies the decision altitude for the approach, typically 200 feet above the threshold. The outer marker is often at or near the glide slope intercept and serves as the final approach fix if using the non-precision localizer only approach. Aircraft will follow the guidance down to the runway as both signals become narrower and more sensitive. An aircraft at a certain point, say at the outer marker, will have the needles deviate a certain amount as it gets further away from the center line of both the glide slope and localizer. The FAA will test your ability to interpret this deflection and give a distance the aircraft is offset. A chart like this one is used on the exam. It splits up the localizer and glide slope images, but we could use the three-dimensional view of the approach to illustrate. We'll start off with just the glide slope. The exam will say the outer marker is 5.6 miles from the runway. As the aircraft approaches, it's below the glide slope, and so the needle starts all the way at the top. As we fly in, the needle comes to center just as we reach the outer marker. We're on the glide slope. There could also be positions below and above the glide slope that look like these. Each of these lines will represent one dot of deflection on the receiver. So if we get to the line above the glide slope, the needle moves down to the bottom of the ring. On a receiver with four dots like this one has, the edge of the ring represents the first dot, close quote. Some figures will be thrown out here for each dot. The first dot will be 210 feet off center, and the second dot will be double that, 420 feet off center. So here, at one dot, we're 210 feet above the glide slope. Keep in mind again that these are not standard distances. The actual length of the deflection at the outer marker will depend on both the sensitivity of the signals, as we said, and the position of the outer marker, which is also not a standard position since glide slope intercept altitudes vary. If we go two dots above, we could say we're 420 feet from the center now. Same thing if we go two dots below. 
This is typically the kind of thing we'll only see on the exam, as we don't think in terms of how far in feet we are from ILS guidance. For a glide slope, we usually think about changing our rate of descent to match our correct for glide slope indications instead. We can look at this the same way though for the localizer. Again, we'll be given distances for each dot of deflection, so moving one dot to the right puts us on the edge of the donut, which is 775 feet off center. Moving two dots off doubles it to 1550 feet. So the important thing to remember is that both the localizer and glide slope signals become more sensitive as we approach the runway. It's like a narrowing corridor that closes down to a single point. As we follow the guidance down, we reach the middle marker, where both signals become more sensitive. One or two dots of deflection equate to shorter distances of deviation than they did at the outer marker. Here's what all that looks like on the test. You'll see this chart, and then they'll show you a VOR receiver like the one on the top left. Again, as we approach the outer marker, we're below glide slope with the needle at the top, coming down to center. Distances are given here which are the same as we introduced in that 3D illustration. If we get a bit high, we're one dot deflected. Now, notice here, the VOR receiver looks a bit different. It has five dots on each side instead of four in the last example. So one dot, quote unquote, of deflection actually is on that first dot. Again, this is 210 feet above center. If the aircraft also moves right of center, two dots off at the outer marker, it will be 1,550 feet off. The test will ask us about this position, either by mentioning it as 5.6 miles out or at 1,500 feet altitude. Keeping the same degree of deflection, we fly inbound and the scale narrows. We get to 1.9 miles out, or 500 feet altitude, and now the deflection is shorter. Even though the needles are showing the same thing, we're only 70 feet high and 710 feet off to the right. It's a bit awkward how these questions are asked, but they're designed to have you show that you know how the sensitivity of the ILS works. Just keep in mind that there are some things that are always standard on an ILS, like the 700 foot width of the localizer at the runway threshold, and some things that vary from approach to approach. Are you looking for IFR ground school? Flight Insight is used by hundreds of pilots to not only pass their test and check ride, but to learn all the tough concepts and make lifelong improvements in their flying. Besides almost 100 videos like this one, IFR Ground School includes comprehensive test prep with an ever-expanding bank of practice questions and an endorsement to take the real exam. Already a perfect IFR pilot? You could support Flight Insight without enrolling in the course by just subscribing to the channel here, hitting that like button, and watching some more of our videos coming out each Tuesday and Friday at noon Eastern.